It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows blank and bare gaze at him with a spectral glare as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord Town. He heard the bleeding of the flock in the twitter of birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed who at the bridge would be the first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag in April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. You know the rest in the books you've read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball, from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again, under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. They came three thousand miles and died, to keep the past upon its throne. Unheard beyond the ocean tide, their English mother made her groan. The foe long since in silence slept, Alike the conqueror silence sleeps, and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. The Battle of Lexington and Concord is one of the most storied events in American history. It started the Revolutionary War that won America its freedom, and in many ways epitomized central themes of American identity. Famous poems commemorating this event have given rise to such phrases as the British are coming and the shot heard round the world, and the idea of the Minuteman has inspired American citizens and institutions alike. But what actually happened here in Massachusetts on that brisk April day? Are the legends true? Who really won? What happened? And why did all of this happen? In today's special episode of the Decisive Battles of the World, we're taking a look at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Here we'll explore the context and lead up to this battle, the forces, men, and weapons involved, the terrain and locations of the battlefield, and of course the battle itself and its impact as well as footage from the modern day battlefield. This video has chapters, so you can skip to specific sections you're more interested in, but I recommend you watch the whole thing since there's so much to learn here. Anyways, thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do all that fun stuff, follow me on X and Instagram. And now, on to the video. So, what was going on in America at the time? Well, the lead-up to Lexington and Concord is pretty much the general lead-up to the American Revolution. This is one of the more debated and studied parts of history, so we don't need to go too deep into the weeds here, but here's just a rough overview. Most tellings of the early American story start with the French and Indian War, which starts in 1754. This was arguably the First World War, I'm a poet dude, and saw the superpowers of Europe clash in North America and the Old World for supremacy. The conflict started between England and France, who controlled most of North America, but had a mutually contested region in the Ohio River Valley. Neither side could agree on who controlled it, and before long the French started building forts there. Hoping to push them back, the English sent out a small military expedition led by none other than Lieutenant George Washington, who ambushed a French and Indian force at Eumonville Glen. This would snowball into the wider Intercontinental War. By the end of things, in 1763, France had lost and had to concede pretty much all of its North American territory, including the disputed region and Canada while Spain got the Louisiana Territory west of the Mississippi River. This was a big deal for two reasons. One was that it meant that there was more land for English colonists to expand into, and the other was that England was broke. In both respects, the colonists got the short end of the stick. While the war was over, the British had made the proclamation line of 1763, 
which banned settlement past the Appalachian Mountains, instead keeping the newly acquired territory for Native Americans, many of which had helped the English in the war. While we can say today that this was an honorable, noble move, this really made the colonists mad since they felt like the whole reason for fighting and dying in the war was to get this contested territory, and now they couldn't even use it. Mind you, people were still settling there illegally, but that didn't really change things. At the same time, the system of salutary neglect came to an end. Before the war, English colonists had largely been exempt from having to pay taxes since the region was so profitable for the empire and too far away to control effectively. To put it mildly, the colonists were somewhat spoiled and actually had the highest living standards of anyone in the world. And now that level of freedom and economic comfort was coming to an end. The next year in 1764, attacks on sugar and molasses were levied, followed by the infamous Stamp Act the next year, which taxed every single piece of paper. But the colonists were stubborn, and they weren't interested in paying these taxes. Effective boycotts and smuggling forced the English to repeal the taxes, but in 1766, they passed the Declaratory Act, which essentially said that the English Parliament had total control of the colonies, and while they may have won this round, things were going to change. While England had a parliament, which supposedly represented the people, there was no representatives for the 13 American colonies. As such, the idea of no taxation without representation emerged in America. Taxes are okay only if you can vote for the government that taxes you. Since the colonists had no say in the government, they felt that they shouldn't be taxed. But the English disagreed, and just the next year, in 1767, they passed the Townshend Acts, which were sweeping taxes on various commodities, such as glass, lead, tea, and paper. This led to more discontent, including rioting, tarring, and feathering of officials, and just a run-of-the-mill tax evasion. So, the very next year, English troops were sent to the epicenter of the issues, Boston. Boston and the wider Massachusetts colony were very radical for the time, maybe like a modern-day Portland, Oregon. It was a violent place with lots of borderline illegal groups in high places, including Freemasons and the Sons of Liberty. But these British troops, called regulars, sometimes made things worse, like in 1770 when the quote-unquote Boston Massacre. Here, a riotous crowd were assaulting British troops, and the British troops ended up firing on them in a fit of confusion, killing five. This only ramped tensions up even more, and by 1773 the English capitulated again. They repealed the Townshend Acts, but replaced them with the Tea Act, which mandated that the colonies buy taxed tea only from Britain. But surprise surprise, this didn't go over well either, and the same year the famous Boston Tea Party happened. This enraged England, who sent more troops to Boston and placed it under martial law, as well as dissolving its civilian government and putting it under direct rule of England. This Massachusetts state government, however, just moved inland and went underground. A civil resistance movement in the state was strong and spreading through the country, especially in wider New England and Virginia. To this day, people debate exactly what the revolution was about. Some take a very cynical view and say that it was just a group of elite white guys who thought that they were better than everyone and didn't want to pay taxes. In mainline historiography, it's a little less cynical, and explanations from economic issues to humanist philosophies, the unique independence of colonial living, and class warfare have all been proposed as primary drivers. We're not going to solve the puzzle here, but for anyone interested, I recommend the book The Idea of America by Gordon Wood, which pretty much takes a look at all of the big proposed factors of what really made America. These books are good as well. Generally speaking, though, it is agreed that the idea of full-scale independence wasn't common in the whole country. Only maybe a third of people supported it even during the war. Before the war, that wasn't even really a big idea. But the support was across all classes of people when it did finally arise. But anyways, let's look at the proximate lead-up to the Battle of Lexington and Concord. 
the British forces in Boston were commanded by General Thomas Gage, who initially had around 4,000 men in Massachusetts. But as time went on, he got increasingly nervous. Massachusetts had many local militias who were organized in 1636, and over the preceding months, these militias had been starting to arm themselves and train with increasing regularity, and he didn't have enough men to effectively occupy the whole colony. As such, his control was pretty much limited to the area around Boston, and he asked for reinforcements from across the ocean. At first, his requests were brushed off, only receiving about 700 marines, but with time he got more and more, totaling around 6,000 troops in Boston by April of 1775. The treatment of the locals wasn't kind, but often far better than portrayals in media at the time. Yes, they did have propaganda and fake news and misinformation back in the 1700s. Still, the excesses of martial law made an impact on the colonists, big enough to get the Third Amendment into the American Constitution decades later, barring troops from quartering in people's homes. Outside of the Boston area, troops would occasionally be sent out to try and capture stores of weapons in the countryside. But due to a robust colonial intelligence network, these raids were often preempted, and any significant stores were hidden and dispersed. Before Lexington and Concord, militias would square off against British regulars, but the militias hardly engaged in real combat, and neither did the British. Notably, in 1774, British troops seized powder stores near Boston, but false rumors of fighting brought out hundreds of militiamen and started riots, forcing many civilians to flee and prompting the British to be more subtle in their future plans. In December of that year in New Hampshire, militiamen stormed Fort William and Mary and exchanged fire with its six-man garrison, although no fatalities occurred. Tensions were rising, and the idea of war was becoming less and less far-fetched. In April of 1775, the British learned of rumors that there was a significant store of weapons and ammunition in the towns of Worcester and Concord. While the colonists had a very good spy network, so did the British at this time. Worcester was far off, and seizing ammo there would be impossible in a timely manner, but Concord was much closer, only about 15 miles away. As early as January, the British were considering ramping up crackdowns in Massachusetts, and in April England gave the go-ahead to Gage with a copy of the order arriving on April 15th and the official version coming the next day. Gage was instructed by London to capture leaders of the Continental Congress, but he was given discretion on how to go about this. While capturing the leaders would be difficult, since people, you know, have legs, and thus wouldn't be something he actively pursued, Gage still sought to take the stores at Concord, which he knew would at least be partially relocated, and planned on targeting weapons as well as meat, flour, tents, and other supplies that could be used by the military. Gage did everything he could to maintain the element of surprise. A hodgepodge formation of elite troops was formed, and Gage had spies of his own who informed him of the rebellious leadership structures. Throughout the day of April 18th, British cavalry would stop and question messengers around Boston, and when the sun fell, they stayed out to catch stragglers. At 10pm, Boston went into curfew with the ferry to Charlestown and the Boston Neck being closed for the night. No one could enter or leave the city. At the same time, the British troops mustered in Boston Common. Led by Majors Francis Smith and John Pitcairn, the soldiers began to ferry across Boston Harbor in overcrowded boats to the West Mainland, cutting down the time they had to travel over land. On paper, this all sounded like a great plan, but there was a problem. Actually, there was a lot of problems. As it turns out, the colonists already knew that Concord would be a target for over a week, since they had spies in London and knew an order had been given weeks before. As such, they had moved to the important stores of weapons long before the British ever mobilized. The initial British preparations on the 15th alerted the locals further, and the Provincial Congress adjourned to go into hiding the next day, with most members fleeing into the country, including John Hancock and Sam Adams, who went into Lexington. Further, the colonists had noticed the boats being drawn up in the evening of the 18th, allowing William Dawes to leave Boston through the Neck before curfew and move through Cambridge, although he isn't actually thought to have played a significant role in warning people. 
Once troops started to mobilize, Paul Revere was able to trigger a signal to the rebels in Charlestown, having his compatriots put two lanterns in the steeple of the Old North Church. Revere then fled Boston by boat, slipping past a gunship, and made it to Charlestown to warn militia there, acting as a redundancy to those lanterns. Mounting a fast horse, he set off a chain reaction. The colonists had arranged an alarm and muster system where riders would warn yet more riders as well as the militia leaders and members. In this way, the Massachusetts militias were armed and ready for miles around Boston long before any battles ever took place. Revere would arrive in Lexington around midnight, so the poem is a little wrong, and warned Hancock and Adams to flee and Dawes would join him about a half hour later. They rode on further west, and Revere and Dawes were captured by British troops, but a third rider with them, Samuel Prescott, was able to escape and ride on to Concord. That's another inaccuracy. The poem, Revere, didn't actually make it into Concord. The whole countryside knew the British were coming before the soldiers even finished ferrying to land, which was at around 2 a.m. on April 19th. The British regulars marched through the night, presumably quite miserable. They had already been up all day and had already been mustered that night, and they had just spent the last four hours in cramped boats where they had to stand up to even fit into, and they landed in the swampy area of Leechmere Point to try to avoid prying eyes. So, of course, they were wet, sometimes sinking to their waist in the muck. Plus, it was April in Massachusetts before climate change, uh, so it was cold, and snow was still on the ground in patches. The walk to Lexington lasted for about three hours. As they marched, they quickly realized that they had been made. Riders and militiamen were spotted on the roads, and at least one man even discharged his pistol when he saw the British, although accounts vary if this was a just a shot in the air or actually at the troops. By around 4 a.m., Major Smith sent a rider back to Boston to ask for reinforcements, anticipating that there may be a battle ahead. Meanwhile, around 130 militiamen were arrayed in Lexington, where rebel leaders had fled from. The town was on the way to Concord, so they knew that the British would pass by on the Bay Road on their way. But like the British, the militia weren't keen on being up and outside all night if they could help it, and when hours passed without any sightings, Captain John Parker of the Lexington Militia allowed his men to disperse to nearby areas by around 3 a.m., as long as they were ready to reassemble at a moment's notice. But finally, Parker got word that soldiers were close as the sun started to rise. Around 5 a.m., he raised to the alarm for his men to assemble, and as the English walked into view, neither commander knew that the birth of a new nation was about to begin here. In terms of weapons, both the British and Americans had similar capability. Starting with the British regulars, the primary weapon was the land pattern musket, more commonly known as the Brown Bess. These, along with most all long guns at the time, were flintlock muzzle loaders. This process usually allowed a soldier to fire two to four rounds a minute, and the gun had a front sight, contrary to popular belief. The Brown Bess technically came in a couple different lengths, but by this point in history, the short land pattern variant was used by the British. It had a 42-inch barrel and weighed 11 pounds. In terms of caliber, the Brown Bess was a 75 caliber, although since it was a musket, the actual size of the balls would have been a bit smaller. The standard load for a soldier was to carry 36 rounds in three 12-round bags, usually self-contained in a textile sack carrying the ball and powder, with the sack serving as wadding to tighten the seal. There has been debate over how accurate these guns were, and certainly by modern standards they were quite abysmal, only standing a chance of hitting a specific person within less than 100 yards or so. But, and this is something we'll talk about later, muskets weren't employed as precision weapons. While they were in fact aimed, the idea that they weren't is a myth. They were utilized against enemy formations rather than a specific person. As such, engagements with muskets regularly started at around 300 yards, with about a 10% hit rate on an enemy formation at that distance. Affixed to the barrels of the muskets were socket, also known as zigzag bayonets. 
These were made of steel and were 17 inches long, usually canted slightly to the side to avoid accidents while reloading. The cross section was triangular and didn't have a strong edge, so it was more of a thrusting weapon, and the triangular cross section made wounds hard to treat. By the time the British arrived in Lexington, they already had their bayonets affixed to their guns. In a desperate melee, the musket could also be used as a club. For the limited cavalry troops, two main weapons would have been used. One was a flintlock dragoon pistol. This was a 67 caliber gun with a barrel around 10 to 12 inches long. Since it was smaller, it was easier for mounted troops to use and reload, although its effective range was more limited, likely only within 10 yards or so. The other weapon was a cavalry saber, likely in this context reserved for mounted officers. These swords were not yet mass produced in a standardized pattern, so some variance was sure to exist. However, they tended to be curved, single-edged blades around 32 inches long, and have a knuckle bow hilt to protect the hand. Artillery also played a small role in Lexington and Concord, and two six-pound cannons did make an appearance. While we don't know much about the guns, it's likely that they were made of bronze. Bronze guns were much lighter than iron ones, and given the context, it's likely that this would have actually been a critical factor. The term six pound or six pounder comes from the weight of the ball the cannons fired, not the weight of the cannon, obviously, uh, which was closer to 800 pounds. These balls were made of cast iron, a bit over three and a half inches wide, and while other types of shot could be used, they weren't present in this battle. The cannons themselves could have varied in length, but given the context, it's likely something on the smaller side, closer to around 5 feet long, were used. Since bronze guns were softer and lighter, however, they couldn't handle as much powder, and thus had a shorter range than cast iron cannons, likely only around 1,200 yards. Each of these guns had 24 shots on their side carriages. The basic infantry soldier was the main group of soldiers in most engagements, although they took more of a secondary role in this battle. Instead, the main expeditionary group consisted of two main elite troops, Grenaders and Light Infantry. Grenaders, while historically had used grenades, no longer did so by this point in history. Instead, Grenaders were elite shock troops, usually larger men, and were selected for their bravery and strength. In close quarters combat, few could match them. Light infantry, on the other hand, were chosen for speed and marksmanship. As we'll talk about in a moment, they would often work as skirmishers in smaller units, moving off the roads to clear ambushes or enemies in rough terrain, taking more deliberate aim instead of massed volley fire. Some of these men equipped themselves with hatchets, but otherwise all of these groups had the same musket and bayonet. Officers usually went with a saber at this time, and were not equipped for actual fighting except in dire circumstances. There were also men on horseback as well, although these weren't dedicated cavalry fighters, rather they served as scouts and communication lines. The officers Smith and Pitcairn were also mounted on their horses as well, and may have had sabers as well as pistols. Turning to the Americans, Weapons were largely the same, although there was some more variance, since they weren't a single organized group. Some Americans were armed with different, older models of muskets, including long land patterns, which had a slightly longer 46-inch barrel than the Brown Bess. Other makes of musket, both domestically produced and of French make from trade in earlier conflicts, were used as well, but there are no numbers on this front, and all these guns pretty much worked the same. Pistols may also have been used in the battle, as again, the militia often supplied their own arms, rather than them being issued. Interestingly, it is possible that the American musket balls may have actually been deadlier than their British counterparts. Since American balls were generally homemade, they may have had a little ridge on them from the imperfect press. The damage caused from the wounds was actually remarked on after the battle by the British, who thought that the Americans were scoring their balls, so they fragmented easier. The Americans had two main types of weapons that the British were lacking, both on totally opposite ends of the spectrum. On the one end was a style of gun called a fouling piece, which today we would just call a shotgun, 
used for hunting birds, these flintlocks could use both round shot as well as shot shells, which was a cartridge containing multiple balls. It's like a modern shotgun shell. Unlike the more well-known blunderbuss, which may have seen some rebel use in the battle as well, fouling pieces usually had longer barrels than the average musket. As such, depending on the ammo used, they could work just as well as a brown bess, but again, these came in various calibers, barrel lengths, and types of ammo. The other, more well-known type of weapon would have been the long rifle. Unlike muskets, rifles had, well, rifling, spiraled grooves inside the barrel that forced the ball to spin, making it more stable in flight. The ball was snug in the barrel, making it for a tighter seal, and thus better accuracy. Because of this, it also took longer to load. But in return, the rifles had far superior accuracy to a musket. Unlike muskets, which were optimized to hit area targets, rifles were meant for hunting and precision, and as such could hit man-sized targets at 200-300 to 300 yards, at least triple that of a musket. Most barrel lengths would have been in the 40s inch range, and interestingly, the calibers were smaller in the 40 calibers range. For melee weapons, the Americans also had bayonets, as well as hatchets and tomahawks, likely in greater numbers than the British. Many homemade blades were used as well, including rapiers, sabers, and dirk daggers. Cuttos, a short sword in the style of a saber, may also have been used in close quarters fighting. Before we talk about tactics, let's quickly talk about troop organization, something that was roughly similar for both sides. The basic unit size in this era was the company, officially around 40 men strong, but sometimes a little larger or smaller as well. A company was commanded by a captain and two lieutenants, although the captain would be replaced by either Major Smith or Pitt Karen for two of the companies. Companies were made up of two platoons, around 20 men each. Conversely, 10 companies made a battalion, which was around three to 400 men strong. While the battle wasn't part of a long-term campaign, and thus lacked many auxiliary personnel, drummers and fifemen would be present in order to keep order and raise morale, as well as give auditory signals louder than a person could yell. In terms of tactics, the opposing forces both relied on open field formation fighting and skirmishing. In general, two main styles of formations were used, lines and columns. The later was a long, deep formation that allowed for easier movement of troops down roads and the like, while lines were the opposite. Wide and thin, troops would assemble themselves facing the enemy, usually two or three ranks deep, and tightly packed together, in order to maximize the firepower they could bring to bear. Of course, smaller groups of men in broken terrain would move in a less organized fashion. In field fighting, both formations would often start to engage at around 300 yards, although this wasn't often the case in this battle, for reasons that we'll get into. As they closed, they would of course maneuver as applicable, trying to force the enemy into a worse position, or hold them in place while another unit flanked them. If the two sides closed to within 100 yards or so, things tended to get pretty brutal. Fire at this distance would decimate the enemy, and they were close enough together for bayonet charges to be possible, resulting in a bloody melee that usually resulted in one side running away rather than an actual fight. Regarding the actual shooting, there were three main tactics used in line formations. The most common was section fire, where two or more sections of men would trade off firing, ensuring that there was always a prepared unit at any given time, while allowing more opportunities to shoot at the enemy. Volley fire also existed, where the entire unit would all fire at once, delivering a devastating barrage on the enemy. This, however, left the formation vulnerable while the entire group was reloading, and was usually only used just before a bayonet charge or to preempt an enemy charge. Something called ragged fire would occur as well, and this was mostly just troops firing at will without any order. A special type of fire also made an appearance in the battle called street fire. Meant for narrow areas, street fire would see the troops in column formation with only the front row of men firing at once. When they fired, they would file to the back of the column while the next rank would fire and kind of just repeating the process and rallying back to the back while they reloaded. When we look at skirmishing, the goal wasn't so much to destroy the enemy, but rather to take pot shots at the larger formation 
who often wouldn't bother to form up and fire back given the small number of elusive men. Skirmishers, especially Americans with rifles, would try to target enemy officers, although this was seen as unsportsmanlike by the British for the most part. British skirmishers, on the other hand, were mostly concerned with anti-skirmisher tactics, finding and fighting American ambushes before they were able to hurt the main formation. Some level of order existed, although this may have been mostly on the British side. Although keep in mind many American troops at this time would have been veterans from the British military, so they would have known these tactics as well, and may have also used them. This is where light infantry troops really shined, and they would break off from the main formation and fight in broken terrain, such as forests, alleys, or steep hills. Moving in a file column, two men across, the light infantry skirmishers would split off in two-man files to engage the enemy, still keeping close by to coordinate movement. These files would continue the alternating principle of section fire with file fire, where one man would fire at a time while the other held their fire until the other had reloaded, ensuring there was always a man to fire if the enemy closed in or flanked them. Skirmishing required better marksmanship as well, given the lack of massed fire, and often saw troops fighting from behind cover so as to avoid the far more powerful formation fires of larger units. Looking at the force sizes on that day, the number of men fluctuated throughout the battle, mostly on the American side, and not all of a given force was always engaged in any one battle, so giving broad total numbers can be misleading. As such, I will be clarifying at each stage of the battle how many men were involved, roughly. That being said, we know that Smith and Pitcairn's initial force was made up of 21 companies, 11 Grenadier and 10 Light Infantry companies, for a total of around 750 to 800 men. The aforementioned reinforcements, which would arrive later, added about another thousand men consisting of four battalions, one of which was Marines, as well as two six-pound cannons. The rebels, on the other hand, would grow in power through the day, eventually totaling close to 4,000 men from various local militia units. The British had three main commanding officers. Major Smith was the main man in charge of the operation, while Major Pitcairn was likely the main officer to lead the regulars into Lexington. At the Concord Bridge, the officer in charge was Captain Walter Lorry, who was a subordinate to the other two. The relief force was led by Brigadier General Hugh Earl Percy. The Americans, of course, had their own officers, First was Colonel John Parker in charge of the Lexington Militia. At the time of the battle, Parker had tuberculosis and had a very weak voice. Next was Colonel James Barrett, who would command the assorted militias at Concord, along with his second-in-command, Major John Buttrick, who would actually march with the men to the bridge. Later in the retreat, Major General William Heath would take command of the larger Massachusetts force. Of course, both sides had dozens of officers, but these are the guys that played some of the largest roles in the fighting. If you couldn't already tell by the name of the battle having two cities, the battle was not exactly a single event, rather it was a series of engagements, some little more than skirmishes or even one-sided massacres, while others were full-fledged battles involving hundreds of men and dozens of officers. The battle largely took place over the span of what is called the Bay Road, starting at Boston in the east. At the time, Boston was almost an island only connected to mainland Massachusetts by the Neck to the southeast. The relevant road itself stretched about 17 miles east to west, coming from Boston south through the Neck before hooking north over the Charles River and then west through various townships, including Monotomy, Lexington, Lincoln, and Concord. Although, of course, other roads existed in the area, including one through Cambridge into Charlestown to the north. As stated earlier, the main force left by boat and cut over to Lechmere Point, cutting their travel distance, but the British reinforcements would take the conventional path through the neck. Zooming in on Lexington, the main point of interest is the town green, essentially a central, roughly triangular lawn for the town about a hundred yards from north to south. Various houses, including a town meeting house and just private residences, were in the area as well, because, like, 
it was a town. Moving to Concord, we see more relevant geography. The town was to the east of a confluence of three rivers. The Asaba and Sudbury rivers merged to become the Concord River a few hundred yards from the main town, centered around a pond. The Concord River was about a hundred feet across. Two bridges crossed rivers to the west of the town, with the aptly named South Bridge crossing the Sudbury River to the west, and the North Bridge about a mile to the north across the Concord River. About 400 yards to the northwest of the bridge was a rise about 150 feet high, which was a pasture on the Brown Farm. Less than a mile north of that was Punkatasset Hill, which rose about 300 feet. About a mile and a half to the west of the North Bridge was the Barrett Farm, where a detachment of soldiers would go to search for war supplies. To the east of the town was a ridge about 200 feet high and a mile long, running along the north of the Bay Road, which fed into Concord from the east. The Mill Brook ran south of the road from the pond, but intersected it about a mile east of the town at a place called Miriam's Corner. In terms of the countryside itself, it was typical of New England. Many homes and cultivated fields lined the road, providing cover as well as longer sight lines. Hedges and stone walls often separated these plots. Additionally, there were large swaths of unkempt forest, usually with sight lines less than 100 yards or so. The area was also quite hilly, making hidden movement and flanking easier. Some hills had steep exposed rock faces, making them unassailable from certain directions. As we stated for the weather, there was still some snow on the ground and vegetation was starting to come back, but it was a relatively regular day weather-wise. As the sun rose over Massachusetts and the countryside buzzed with anticipation, Major Pitcairn led six light infantry companies, around 200 to 250 men, ahead of the main column into Lexington. Before coming into town, the men fixed their bayonets and loaded their weapons, a surprising order for them, and one that would be maintained for the rest of the day. At the same time, Captain Parker got word that the approaching troops were only about two miles away, and called for his three companies to return and form up. However, only 80 men answered the call in time, somewhat surprising since Parker's militia was among the most disciplined and well-trained in the state. Parker's men were formed up on the north side of Lexington Green in two ranks, and bystanders were gathered along the road to see what would happen. As the British marched into view, things became chaotic. Both commanders had no intention of starting a fight. Pitcairn was concerned with marching onto Concord and completing his mission, and until this point, the American militias had shown to be all bark and no bite, dispersing when ordered to by the British. Parker, for his part, knew he was outmanned and outgunned, and had no intention of getting his men killed for a useless fight. He wanted a show of force, perhaps to bark very loudly, but the location of his men was intentional. In sight of the road, but not in a real fighting position, or obstructing the path of the regulars. He took this very seriously, and ordered his men to stand firm, threatening to shoot anyone who ran. When Pitcairn saw the Lexington militia arrayed on the far side of the green, he rode towards them and accosted them and pointed his saber, demanding they surrender their weapons and disperse. His troops came off the road and followed him, and he ordered them to surround the militia and seize their arms. Parker obliged and ordered his men to go home but he had tuberculosis, making him lose his voice. He was hard to hear over the noise of jeering redcoats, and none of his men laid down their arms, but the formation did slowly start to disperse. Then, a shot rang. To this day, no one knows who fired the first shot, and both sides blamed each other. Either way, we know what happened next. The British started to fire in a scattered volley, first a couple, then dozens, then perhaps hundreds of men letting loose on the rebels. Some Americans returned fire, but to little effect, only grazing two Brits as well as Pitcairn's horse. The Americans fled as the British charged, bayoneting at least one wounded man, Jonas Parker, cousin of the captain, who was trying to reload his weapon. Pitcairn tried to call off his men, but to no avail, 
and it wasn't until Major Smith rode into town with the main column that order was restored. When the smoke cleared, the British were hardly scathed, while seven militia were killed and another nine wounded. Only two of those men were killed on the original line, with most of the men shot in the back as they were retreating, including Jonathan Harrington, who made it to his nearby home before dying on his doorstep. Another American who had been captured earlier by the main column was also shot while trying to run away. It is possible that this shot is what the men on the green heard. With Smith's arrival, the troops commemorated their victory, firing a celebratory volley before reforming and continuing on the road to Concord. Lexington is undoubtedly where the Revolutionary War started, but it was hardly a battle. It was much more in line with the moniker of Massacre, and likely more deserving of that title than its Bostonian counterpart five years earlier. Speaking of Boston, Smith's letter requesting reinforcements lay idle. No Brits in Boston bothered touching it for hours, and when it was finally read, it was delivered mistakenly to Pitt Karen's house, who was out with the column already. It wasn't until the morning that the mistake was discovered, and Brigadier General Hugh Percy was dispatched with a force of about a thousand men and two cannons. The men left Boston through the neck at around 9 a.m., four hours after the start of the war, singing a parody of Yankee Doodle as they began their long march through the countryside. To go faster, Percy didn't bring an ammo carriage with him, and instead the ammo would follow behind him a ways. Meanwhile, the British march to Concord was uneventful, but various militias had already assembled in and around the town. As the Redcoach approached Concord at around 7 a.m., two hours after the fighting in Lexington, five or six militia companies in Concord first approached to take the high ground east of the town, then fell back to the west and assembled on Punkatasset Hill across the river to assess the situation. The militia here were led by Colonel James Barrett, who looked on as the British force raided the town. Since most of the supplies had been hidden or moved days and weeks earlier, the British didn't find much. After gathering what the contraband they could find, including cannon, trunnions, carriages, 60 barrels of flour and tents, as well as 500 pounds of musket balls, they set the supplies on fire, except for the balls, which they threw into the river. While this was going on, Smith sent seven companies to the river. Three stood guard for the Old and North Bridge, one on the bridge itself, and two on the high ground next to the Brown and Buttrick farms to the north between the militia and the bridge, while the other four moved west towards Barrett's farm to try and find more supplies. After finding only a few supplies, the troops ordered Ms. Barrett to make them breakfast, and they tried to pay her for it, but she refused. Colonel Barrett would at some point leave the militia to check on his property, but would return later. Deciding to move closer, the militia moved from Punkatasset Hill to the pasture on the Browns farm at around 9.30 a.m., forcing the two English guard companies on the east of the river to retreat closer to the bridge. Arrayed in a two-man wide column formation, not 400 yards from the bridge, Barrett's formation consisted of 10 companies, about 400 to 550 men. Five companies were Concord natives, while two were from Lincoln, two were from Bedford, and one was from Acton. There, the militia saw the rising smoke from Concord and believed that the British were burning the town. However, this blaze was an accident. As the British were destroying war supplies, the town hall accidentally caught on fire before it was quickly put out by the regulars and the townspeople. After some urging by the militia hoping to save the town from being destroyed, Parker led his men south towards Concord. Forming up in a two-file column led by the most well-commanded Acton Company, followed by the Concord forces, the militia under Major Buttrick moved down the hill and towards the bridge, playing white cockade as they went. The British, seeing the oncoming column, wrongly estimated the enemy at 1,500 men and the British retreated to the other side of the bridge. The three British companies, around 100 men, formed into a street fire formation on the command of Captain Walter Lorry. Due to the unfamiliar command structure, there was confusion and the formation took some time to achieve. Then, three British soldiers without command 
fired shots into the water, presumably thinking that the militia would scatter without a fight like in Lexington. This set off a racket of volley as more Brits fired. When the smoke cleared, two Americans were dead, including Captain Davis from Acton who was shot in the chest, and a private who took a round to the head, three others were wounded. In response, Major John Buttrick from Concord gave the order, God damn them! They're firing balls! Fire them! Fire! Fire! For God's sake, fire! The militia returned fire in their two wide formation, then likely spread out along the riverbank and continued to fire, more organized and outnumbering the Brits. It was these volleys that were the shots heard around the world, since it was the first explicit order by Americans to fire on the regulars. As the guns went silent, the British suffered two dead and eight wounded, including half of their officers at the scene. With most of their command wounded, the British retreated from the bridge, leaving their dead and wounded behind. It was the first time that organized forces on both sides had fired at each other and the first time the militia had actually stood up to Redcoats. Celebrating, the men weren't really even sure what to do with their success at the Era Parting Bridge. Some tried looting or finishing off the British wounded, while many just sort of walked off either after the British or returning to the hill. Getting word of the fighting, Colonel Smith approached the bridge with two Grenadier companies. But after seeing an arrayed position of militia behind a stone wall by the Elisha Jones house, they simply had a standoff, which was interrupted and ended by a mentally ill man trying to sell the soldiers hard cider. The chaotic scene started to crystallize as the four British companies who had crossed the river came back into view, but while both sides eyed each other, the Americans let them pass and returned to the town, eyeing their dead and dying comrades. One of the wounded, an officer who had been brained by a hatchet, was later said to have been scalped by the militia, sowing massive discontent in the British ranks. Confirming the fears that the whole mission was a horrible mistake, the British regrouped and prepared to leave, and marched out of the town to Boston a couple hours later, a bit before noon. Wounded officers were put into carts, while the enlisted casualties were left behind to the Americans. Arrayed in an eight-man-wide, 300-yard column, the Redcoats managed to make it the first mile out of Concord without incident. But as they looked around, they saw dozens of armed men moving through the forests and fields off the side of the road. Even then, they may not have understood the danger they were in, as many militiamen were able to conceal their movements behind Arrowhead Ridge to the north. A flanking guard of four or five companies stayed on Arrowhead Ridge for security. But in the place now called Miriam's Corner, the road came down a hill and narrowed into a small bridge across the Millbrook. Everyone knew that if a fight were to start, it would be here. As the column slowed down and narrowed to get over the bridge, and the flanking guard had to form back into the main column, a formation of Bedford, Chelmsford, and Balerica militia approached from the north, taking cover around the buildings of the farm. It's believed that here the Bedford militia offered the first offensive American action of the war, and by the time the Brits crossed the bridge, at least two were killed and many wounded. From here, it was a constant battle all the way. Militia snipers tried to pick off officers, while English skirmishers tried to clear out ambushes on the side of the road. For almost the whole seven mile route to Lexington, the English rear guard had to walk backwards, constantly engaging militia formations. Many officers dismounted from their horses to avoid being targeted. And the targeting of officers in this battle would start to lead many officers later in the war to start carrying long guns so as to blend in with the wider group. The next significant obstacle the column approached was Brooks Hill, about 15 minutes later. As the British moved towards the rise, they spotted around 500 militiamen from Sudbury, Framingham, and Bedford standing to the south of the road. To drive the Americans off the ridge, Smith ordered the British to attack. Taking heavy casualties, the Redcoats forced the colonists to retreat, but rather than trying to rout them, Smith cut his losses and kept the column moving. Going east, the column was approaching its most dangerous expanse yet. Approaching a hairpin turn that would later be called the Bloody Angle, 
Sudbury and Framingham militias moved to the south of the road, taking pot shots as they went. At the same time, the militia units from Miriam's Corner outran the Brits, taking positions in the wooded area along the outside of the angle. Arriving in time to engage as well, three companies from Woburn, as well as some Framingham men, arrived and took position on the inside of the angle. Fire rained down on the column from all sides at close range. The woods made any defensive formation impossible, while the slope of the road allowed a militia to fire down onto the column. About 30 minutes later, the Brits came to another wooded area with raised rock formations nearby. Here, John Parker and his Lexington men came back for revenge. About 100 of his men took aim and fired at the column vanguard, as it was once again forced to cross a narrow bridge at a sharp bend in the road. The Brits responded and sent flankers after them, with the column firing en masse to support them. Parker retreated, but not before Smith was injured in the leg. Coming from the east, Percy and his men finally got word of the trouble the main column was in as they approached Monotomy. Moving ahead, they formed up along the high ground half a mile east of Lexington, waiting for their ammunition carriage to arrive. Now getting close to Lexington, the British were panicked. Between them and Lexington lay Fisk Hill, which would slow down the column, so a detachment of redcoats stood and fought at the Bloody Bluff, a large rock outcropping, while the rest of the column hurried along. This only bought them a little time as the British were overwhelmed by the militia's numbers and retreated, and around this time Pitcairn's horse was shot out from under him. At the summit of Fisk's Hill, the skirmishing continued. One famous story tells of a militiaman, Private Hayward, who came face to face with a British soldier on the steps of the Fisk House. The two men traded words, and the two men quickly traded fire, both dying, with Hayward surviving for a time before expiring on the steps of the house. As Lexington came into view, the column rushed forward, with men breaking ranks and running to what they hoped was safety. Mounted officers rode to the front and threatened to kill any soldiers who were fleeing. As the soldiers got into town, they spotted their relief unit. Percy and his 1,000 men and two cannons ringed the high ground to the east of the town. The militia, meanwhile, tried to capitalize on the disarray of the English, but Percy's guns forced them to put their heads down and let the British get to safety. This, however, was a missed opportunity, as the militia weren't aware of the dire ammunition shortage that Percy faced. As Percy's baggage train, which contained 140 rounds for the cannons, entered a monotony, and passed by the cider house, it was stopped by a group of militia XMs, short for exempt men, who were old and not expected to fight. The men guarding the carriage refused, and a fight broke out, killing two redcoats and four horses. The survivors were captured, with the tale of one redcoat allegedly running away from the fight and surrendering to the first person he saw, an old woman. The bodies, as well as the carriage, were buried, and Percy's cannons were stuck with 24 rounds each. Stopping to rest, the British regrouped and reformed, with Percy taking control of the column from Smith and Pitcairn. Percy's fresh troops took the rear, while the main column led the way. Some of the wounded were even draped over the cannons, which still didn't have that much ammo, which Percy was still waiting on. Less than a mile outside of Lexington, the fighting started again. Scared, tired, and outnumbered, the Brits continued their march, now starting to loot and abuse civilians when they came across them. In one such instance, ransackers were actually killed by a homeowner. Pot shots continued as the militia numbers mounted, getting higher and higher until it would eventually reach 4,000 men. By this point, the British had only 1,700 or so less than half as many. Passing through hills where they had to narrow, the column took more and more fire. Coming into the Monotomy Plain, the British were engaged from the south by yet more militia units with intense fire, and even used their cannons again in this area. It is also around this time that Major General Heath takes over command of the militia units, who by this point were so big that they could actually form larger conventional fighting units against the English. 
as the column moved into monotony, bloody street fighting took place and the cover of buildings allowed Americans to close distance with the column. Here the Brits encountered the famous Samuel Whitmore, a 78-year-old XM. Famously, the old man hid behind a stone wall on the road near his house and took on some British grenadiers killing one with his musket and two with his prized dueling pistols before charging them with his sword and being shot in the face, clubbed, and bayoneted. Many of the American dead were civilians, both private citizens who had taken up arms against the Redcoats as well as innocents. The British war crimes here were particularly brutal, as exemplified by the surrender of militiamen in Russell's Orchard, in which 11 were killed, some while trying to surrender. In all this chaos, 25 Americans died in monotony, compared to 40 Redcoats. Continuing on, the column made it into Cambridge, where Percy made a key decision. Rather than continuing into the town, he hooked north and moved towards Charlestown. The militia had destroyed that great bridge across the Charles River, and had Percy continued, the column could well have been trapped and routed. He made it just in time, as a whole regiment of militia from Salem came in from the north and would have cut off the road and controlled the high ground at Prospect Hill had they arrived a few minutes earlier. With ammo running low, the Redcoats pushed north, sustaining more casualties and still fighting back, even killing civilians. Percy's horse was shot out from under him, while British troops ran to the riverbank to get a drink since their water had run out hours ago. Heavy fighting continued along Beach and Elm Street as the column moved into Charlestown, and the sun started to set. Finally, as night arrived, the Americans retreated, leaving Charlestown and proceeding to surround Boston. When the battle was over, British and American bodies were strewn across the state. Despite being less disciplined, the numbers and mobility of the militias gave them the edge. The militia suffered 49 men killed and 39 wounded, with 5 missing or captured. The British, by contrast, lost 73 killed, along with 174 wounded and 53 missing or captured. Amazingly, the brave elderly exam Samuel Whitmore would survive, and live 18 more years to the age of 98. The battle was a resounding success for the Americans. By the next day, around 15,000 militia had surrounded Boston. Percy evacuated Charlestown back to Boston over boat, leaving the mainland to the colonists, but they wouldn't keep it too long. In June, the British would return and defeat the colonists at Bunker Hill, securing Charlestown and its surrounding high ground for the British. But that battle was a Pyrrhic victory, putting it in the mind of the British that a fight would not be as easy as they had thought. The wider Boston campaign would be a success for the Americans, who were able to drive the British from the city, keeping New England largely out of the war for its duration. Of course, Lexington was the beginning of the U.S. Revolution, and the preceding aftermath is legendary. The impact of Lexington, in my opinion, was far more symbolic than practical. The battle began over relatively small stakes, and had the battle gone the other way, the British wouldn't have gained much and the colonies wouldn't have lost too much immediately either. Practically, the colonists would have lost some supplies, and most of that loss would have just been in the battle itself with all the spent powder and ball. But otherwise, they wouldn't have much of an issue with fighting in the future. Even if we look at how it ended up going, the Brits didn't lose enough men to have been too horribly mauled for future engagements. I think worst case scenario, the Brits could have lost the whole expedition, say if Percy was further delayed, or if Percy had tried moving through Cambridge on the way back, or if the colonists had just kept up the attack despite the cannons because they had low ammo. This would have been quite the blow, but again, I think this would be more symbolically powerful than anything. Remember that there were still thousands of troops in Boston by this point. It's also possible that had it gone more in the direction for the Brits, the colonists wouldn't have tried surrounding Boston 
but I honestly, I doubt that, since if the Brits really had destroyed the Minutemen, the remaining militias would be so angry and numerous that they would do it anyway. Again, overnight, 11,000 militia just appeared from the state, so it wasn't like, even if they killed every single militiaman in the battle, that they would have actually made that big of a dent in the wider number of the state militias. If we look more medium term, I think it's a fair point to make that the surrounding of Boston, which again I think would happen no matter what, was crucial to the beginning of the war. The siege was Washington's first test as supreme commander of the Continental Militias, and his ensuing victory the next year there was crucial for him keeping his position and his army. And I think that you can make an argument that without the victory at Boston, the colonists would have lost faith in Washington totally after New York, which almost actually happened in real life multiple times. But again, I don't think Lexington's outcome was necessary to any of this per se. All that being said, I think Lexington and Concord's main contribution to history was the fact that it A, proved that the colonists could actually put up a fight against the English, and B, it was the start of the American Revolution. I think it's fair to say that some battle like Lexington and Concord was inevitable, but whatever this battle was, whether in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, or Cambridge, or a Boston Revolt, would be deeply significant in history. But one of these alternate battles wouldn't necessarily be the route and resounding success that Lexington was. If the British had won decisively at Concord and scared off the militia from attacking them on the way back, then I think there's a good chance that the British could negotiate themselves out of a war, at least temporarily, since I think the war was pretty inevitable. But again, I think the numbers were too great and the tension was too high, and no matter what, we were going to see a surrounded Boston by tens of thousands of angry militiamen. Lexington and Concord showed that the British Empire could bleed. And if it could bleed, it could be killed. And with the revolution already on a knife's edge in its early, fragile years, the Continentals needed every advantage they could get. They needed the morale the battle provided by showing that the Brits were beatable and that joining the militia wasn't pointless. It showed that the British were cocky and could make mistakes and it paved the way for the first of Washington's victories, which was barely able to succeed as it was, and was barely able to keep up the fight through the next year. Without Lexington and Concord going the way it did, I think it's safe to say that the revolution had a real chance of stalling out and failing in 1776, again, more for strategic reasons than for tactical ones. It was certainly not the only domino to fall just right, there were many bigger and less likely ones that would come later, but it was the first, and without it, who knows what could have happened. So that's it for this video, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. I know it's running pretty long. Remember to like, comment, subscribe uh, for more content. Follow me on Instagram, X, all that fun stuff. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.